Welcome and thank you so much for joining us on At Issue. I'm H. Wayne Wilson. October, of course, is uh, down to the, uh, the, the last length for the election. And this is a month that we will pay attention to the elections. Uh, this particular week, we have the 91st House District race, the 92nd next week. We'll talk to a Supreme Court justice who's running for retention the week after that, and then the 18th Congressional District the last Thursday in October. But today, it is the 91st District, and I thank both the candidates for being here. First, the challenger is a Republican from East Peoria. He sits on the East Peoria City Council. Mike Eunice, thank you for being here. Thank you, H. Thanks for having us. And the incumbent is a Democrat from Canton, Illinois. Uh, Mike Smith has served eight terms in the House, so uh, he is seeking his ninth term there. And with that, uh, this is not a debate. This is an equal opportunity program where I will toss out some topics. I will allow each candidate to respond, and there will be what we normally call rebuttal time for each. But we'll be moving rather quickly through the topics to see uh, how, what their positions are on a variety of issues. And with that, uh, we will start uh, with uh, Mike Smith as the incumbent first. And uh, what everybody's talking about, jobs. Uh, how are you going to create jobs specifically for the 91st? Well, <clears throat> thank you, H, and thanks for having us on. It's always a pleasure to be on with you. Jobs are a key issue. It's uh, definitely something that's on the, the minds of, uh, of the voters. And I think that the job uh, for me as a state representative is sort of uh, like being an ambassador uh, for the district, working with our local communities um, and making sure that, that uh, the state of Illinois is involved with our our cities, our counties, uh, in their efforts to uh, attract jobs. And we've had some success in that. Um, if you look at Cook Medical in Canton, uh, we were able to, to, get, to get the state and the federal government uh, to come in and clean up the Brownfield site at the old International Harvester uh, facility. And now we have a, a new plant there uh, that's going to employ 300 people eventually. Um, but then more directly on the legislative front, uh, we were able to pass legislation this spring on kind of a short notice that that uh, changed the requirements for a tax credit that Keystone took advantage of. Uh, if we had not done that, they they were in jeopardy, frankly, of closing their doors, and that's about 800 jobs that we simply can't afford to lose. So it's a kind of a two-pronged battle, uh, helping attract new businesses, but also uh, retaining the the jobs that we have. And because we have two mics on the program, <laughs> you don't mind if I. I differentiate by saying Mr. Eunice and Mr. Smith. That's so fine. Mr. Eunice. <laughs> well, thanks, uh, um, H. First of all, I don't, I don't think it's the responsibility of the state, or I don't think the state actually creates jobs. I think that's the role of small business. I think small businesses create jobs, and I think what uh, the state legislature can do is get out of the way uh, of small business and let them do what they do best. Um, so I would like to find uh, areas where there's maybe restrictions or roadblocks on businesses from preventing them to do what they do best to help us grow our way out of this mess. And there's a couple examples uh, I, that come to mind on that. Uh, one of them is what, what happened um, uh, in the trucking industry several years back. Uh, we saw that the, the state wanted to try to create revenue and so they imposed an additional fee on, on the trucking industry. And uh, what happened uh, after that as a result, um, we saw uh, tens of thousands of trucking licenses go across our borders, not to India, but to Indiana. And um, we we're seeing Indiana right now, just last year, they had a $1 billion surplus while we're seeing a deficit. Another example of that is where states are, I think, getting in the way of small business and letting them do what they do best is um, uh, um, a bill that uh, my opponent um, not only supported, but sponsored, uh, and that was um, to expand uh, the enterprise zone or expand prevailing wage into the enterprise zone. And so what that would do is allow, um, it was, it's a private business with private money, um, and if they wanted to expand uh, their business uh, and take advantage of the incentives in the enterprise zone, all of a sudden it becomes a disincentive uh, because they would be forced to pay uh, prevailing wage. And I know of one business in particular in uh, the city of East Peoria where they would have been forced to look uh, elsewhere outside the enterprise zone and thus outside uh, the city of East Peoria. So I think those are areas where uh, we want to not push jobs away. We want to be inviting to jobs uh, and expand and, and grow our tax base. And I think that's how we're going to grow our way um, out of the mess that we find ourselves in. 
Uh, rebut, Mr. Smith? Well, I, I would just say uh, regarding the prevailing wage, I think it's important that we have a lot of incentives for businesses. And uh, I think I think in something such as enterprise zones where uh, we are basically giving government credits uh, to businesses who expand, I think that they should um, should meet our, our labor laws and prevailing wage is one of those. Um, I think we've seen too many instances where, uh, you know, companies take government uh, benefits and credits and then move their jobs overseas. And we've got to be concerned about protecting our jobs here in central Illinois as well. And Mr. Yunus. Yeah, and again, I would just say in, in this particular instance, the, the business that I'm referring to, uh, both of the candidates that were going to do the job were very reputable. They were both uh, very local. They were both from, the, from in town. Um, they were both clients of this business. Uh, one was simply double the cost of the other. And I don't think that uh, we should prohibit a private business or force a private business uh, to um, uh, pay an additional fee when they're using all private money. They're using their money and they want to grow their business. Um, uh, this in particular business owner uh, used uh, um, um, a local um, reputable firm to do his work. Let's turn to the subject of the economy. Uh, Thirteen billion dollars, give or take, is the uh, deficit that the state faces. As an individual representative, if elected, what can you do to make sure that that is less of a hole for the state of Illinois? Sure. Well, first and foremost, I, th I think it's important to uh, realize and remember uh, that we did not get to this thirteen billion dollar deficit in, in the in one year's time. Uh, this has been because of a decade of overspending. Uh, we have been uh, spending more than we bring in for at least 10 years now. We've been, uh, unfortunately, the legislature was voting on, on budgets that kept continuing to increase spending and our revenues were, were going down. Um, and so I think it's, it's unrealistic to, to think that we can have a magic pill to get us out of this mess in the course of one budget. Uh, frame. Now it's going to take an immense amount of uh, fiscal discipline, something that um, we've been used to seeing in the city of East Peoria while on serving on the uh, East Peoria City Council. In fact, our last budget term was uh, a very difficult uh, term. Municipalities are seeing shortfalls too. And after the first rounds of budget talks, we saw a $1 million uh, deficit. Now, we could have just washed our hands and said, well, it's too difficult, we don't want to deal with it, but we worked together as a team. And we came together and we prioritized and we met week after week after week after week until, the, until we were able to uh, pass uh, a balanced budget. And it's not easy. And I'm not denying that it's, it's tough work. But that's what our uh, representatives were elected to do. And, um, you know, I think that they should have stayed in, in Springfield and passed a balanced budget. Mr. Smith. Well, certainly this is, uh, I think, the most difficult financial crisis the state has experienced in in almost 200 years. Um, it's compounded by the the national recession, the global recession. Uh, we have revenues are down 25 to 40 percent uh, from what they were prior to the recession. Uh, so it's very difficult to continue operating state government as we had. Uh, we've made significant cuts in the last three years, really almost five billion dollars. Um, we're at a critical juncture now. Uh, if we if we don't uh, if we don't get more revenue or new revenue, uh, we are going to have to have drastic cuts. Uh, the two major areas of spending for the state are education and Medicaid, and I uh, I don't think those are areas that uh, the public, frankly, uh, are ready to see cuts in. Uh, I think. The powers that we uh, gave to the governor, we did pass a budget this spring. It wasn't a budget I think that anybody was happy with, but we gave emergency budget powers to Governor Quinn to get us through uh, this six month period uh, after the election, similar to what we did for Governor uh, Edgar back in the early 90s. Let me interject as part of a rebuttal. Uh, you talked about the East Peoria budget. What specific, one, one item, what would you address with regard to trying to close the $13 billion gap? What first step? Well, I think that we need to go line by line uh, throughout, throughout the budget. I mean, we see um, what a month ago we saw um, 
with people faced with tax increases, we saw double digit pay raises uh, that was given to so many state appointees. I think that that's a slap in the face of the taxpayers. With so many people hurting right now, with so many people unemployed or taking furlough days or pay cuts or pay freezes, to ask voters to dig deeper in their pockets at a time when they're hurting so much and then they turn around and they see double digit pay raises. We've seen so many, um, we've seen even the, the Democrats uh, say that there's, there's areas with Medicaid with all kids that can be reformed. Um, that, that can save the state money. And there's so many different uh, ethics reforms and, and campaign finance reform that, that the state needs right now. And the status quo just simply isn't working. And a first step towards closing the budget? Well, first of all, I, I agree with a lot of what, uh, what Mike said, but that's not going to come anywhere near uh, closing that $13 billion uh, uh, deficit. Uh, I, I agree we need some reforms in the way we do our budget. I have uh, proposed some results-based or performance-based budgeting that I think makes a lot more sense. And we, we start uh, from the scratch every year with zero-based budgeting. We look at programs uh, to see if they're uh, doing what the objectives are, and we do that on an annual basis rather than currently we start with last year's base and just see if we have more money in or less money and where uh, the cuts or the spending need to take place. I think that's the wrong way to do it, and we need to definitely change the way uh, we do our budget. A specific question, starting with you first. Governor Quinn has proposed and has for some time a increase in the state income tax. Do you, pro do you support that proposal or any type of income tax increase? Well, I'm not sure. I think the governor's latest proposal actually is a 1% increase that would go uh, strictly to education. Uh, I have supported an income tax increase. I have said for ever since I have run for office that we needed to change the way we fund education and move away from the local property taxes. In my opinion, the income tax is a fairer way of doing that. And I think most people would agree with that. If we could have property tax relief and shift more of the funding uh, for education to the state level. Uh, but beyond that, uh, we simply cannot solve our budget problems without additional revenue. I think we need uh, the cuts. I think we need pension uh, reform, which we passed this spring. Uh, but we also need additional revenue, and in my opinion, the income tax is the fairest way to do that. Now, I have voted for that, and that may not be the most politically popular thing to do, but I have found that uh, voters, uh, constituents, understand uh, the dire situation that we're in and understand that we need more revenue, uh, provided uh, that we have cuts and provided that that revenue goes where we say it's going to go. Same question to you. Well, first of all, I think with double-digit uh, unemployment rates, um, obviously income tax revenues are down. So I find it hard to believe uh, with people out of work, if you raise the income tax, that that uh, miraculously is going to help uh, education. I, I find that uh, to be very, very troubling. Um, you know, I, I think, again, this is the exact wrong time to uh, raise taxes on our people. With so many people hurting right now, uh, the way to grow... Uh, our tax base and to bring in more revenue is by um, sensible uh, and responsible policies that are going to help small businesses grow our, grow our way out of this mess. Um, this is a, this is an area where um, we this is a time where it is the absolute worst time to to think about a, a tax increase on our on our people right now, and it's only going to continue to drive people out of the state and 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 our job creators are going to continue to leave uh, to go to our bordering states. In a moment to rebut? Well, I just, I, I would challenge my opponent and, and anyone who says that we don't need more revenue to, to say where we're going to cut uh, to meet that deficit. Uh, y you simply can't do it with uh, severely cutting into education, cutting into Medicaid, cutting into human services, and many of those folks have been cut already, and we have programs that are struggling. Uh, you know, we have a cash flow problem in the state of Illinois. We owe money to uh, most of our vendors, uh, to school districts. Uh, we're in a, a crisis situation, and to say that we can do that uh, without additional revenue, I think, is just either naive of the budget process or, or, or of, uh, of uh, the state's fiscal situation, or it's not being honest with the voters, which I think, um, you know, I've had a track record of doing that, even on unpopular issues. Uh, response to the question from the we, representative. We have to start somewhere. And my opponent agreed with a lot of the cost-cutting measures that I uh, placed. He said that he, he agreed with many of those. That, so why don't we do it? Why don't we start? 
why does the answer have to start with a tax increase? You know, I, I admit that it's going to be tough to get out of this uh, budget crisis, and as I said earlier, it's probably going to take more than one budget cycle to do it. Um, as much as I hate to uh, say, you know, one area that we might need to look at as a last resort is some short-term borrowing to help close that gap. But uh, raising taxes on our people right now is going to continue to drive people out, and it's going to continue to cycle into the snowball uh, that we're in. We need to reverse that negative snowball that, that's going downhill right now. Allow me to quote uh, from one of your television ads. Um, your ad states the legislature left town without a budget, and we need to reform Springfield now if you're elected to office in the 91st House District. How are you going to address those situations, understanding how Springfield works? We know the budget is made in the Speaker's office. So how can you make a difference in that regard? Well, you know, again, the, the, I, I would prohibit lump sum budgets. Um, when one of the main jobs of, a, of the state legislature is to pass a budget. Now, it's not, it's not an easy task to do, but that's their job. And, um, you know, if they don't want to do their job, uh, then they need to step aside and give someone a chance that, that is willing to, to do it. But to, to remove the authority away from the state legislature and to give that authority to Governor Quinn and say, we don't want to deal with it, you go ahead and, and we give you the authority to, to make the cuts where you, you deem um, appropriate. Um, is, is not the responsibility of the governor, and, and it's, it's not the legislature's uh, job. They're not doing their job. So um, I would say that, uh, you know, that's, that's an irresponsible thing for them to leave town w without a budget. Mr. Smith. Well, uh, again, I would say uh, the powers that we gave to Governor Quinn are the same powers that the legislature back in the early 90s before I was there uh, gave to Governor Edgar. Um, <clears throat> you know, we, we do need uh, cooperation. We need, we need bipartisan uh, cooperation to solve our problems, and that's something we haven't had, frankly, for a long time in Springfield. Now, yes, the Democrats have the majority, uh, but on many uh, of the budget issues, we need a supermajority uh, to pass uh, legislation uh, regarding the budget, and so that requires uh, cooperation. And we work best when we work together, uh, but the spirit of partisanship, the partisan gridlock has been so intense uh, frankly, uh, since the impeachment of Governor Blagojevich, um, and the the eye, I think of the of the minority has been on this coming election, uh, and really a, a, a desire not to uh, to participate in governing. We well, only need a supermajority after a, um, a certain date, so I don't know why you don't start the talks. We know every year when the budget uh, is due, so those those budget talks should start a whole lot earlier. And I agree, we do need bipartisan uh, support, and I would welcome uh, the opportunity to have both parties come to the table and, and discuss. Well, we do need supermajority on bonding issues. Uh, you know that that's any time of the year, uh, so that's that's you know, a time when we, we need full cooperation. Um, every time we have had a financial crisis in the last 30, 40 years, uh, they've been solved, and typically those have been with Republican governors, they've been solved in a bipartisan manner, and we simply haven't seen that. Uh, the final question of the half hour, uh, the pension fund. Uh, Illinois uh, has the distinction of being uh, the most underfunded state in the nation in, with regard to pension. And there has been a proposal put forth by some pension officials that would require or would, would suggest that they sell off some of their assets. Is this a good idea? No, it's not, H. And actually, I think uh, they may be required to do that because of an, of an issue we were just talking about. We could not pass uh, borrowing uh, pension bonding um, for our pension payment this year, which was almost $4 billion because we couldn't get Republican votes on that, even though we had passed it uh, the year before. Uh, so because we haven't been able to pass that so far, we did in the House, the Senate has not. Uh, because of that, um, if we don't do something before January, then many of our pension funds may have to sell off assets. And I think that's the wrong approach when they can earn, uh, hopefully, up to 8.5%, I think is what the actuaries have projected. Um, we, can, we can get a much better 
uh, rate on uh, on bonds, and it just makes more sense uh, to get us through this crisis period. Same question to you, Mr. Yunus. Well, uh, clearly we need uh, to reform our pension system to make it sustainable for our retirees and for our longtime uh, employees. Um, one of the things I, I would not have done, and first let me say this, H, I, I think it's important to, to note why we're in um, such a mess that we're in with our pension systems. For years we have passed uh, uh, budgets that were robbing the pension funds. Uh, my opponent supported and voted for many budgets that robbed the pension funds. On the East Peoria City Council, I have a track record of fully funding our, our pension funds to the penny of what our actuarial report says that we should do. And uh, I think because of the, the, the rating of the pension funds, that's one of the reasons we're in uh, such a mess that we're in. And so we do need to look at reforms. Um, I think it's unfortunate that the reform that was passed in this past session came about and was rammed through in less than 24 hours. After years of talking about the need for pension reforms, I think it's sad, it's sad that the one thing that, that got the legislature to uh, act on it uh, was the threat of um, taking away the ability to borrow and thus spend even more money. Um, so while I agree with parts of the reform that was passed, uh, for example, the two-tiered system that my opponent supported, uh, the manner in which it was done, um, I, I don't agree with. Uh, the unions had little to no input and the general public had little to no input. It was uh, passed in less than 24 hours. Uh, opportunity to rebut? Well, pensions are a major part of our financial crisis. And as I said, I think that the three things we need, pension reform is one of them. And we passed major pension reform this spring. And it was done in a bipartisan effort. I uh, may not have agreed with the way in which uh, the timing occurred, but it, it was an important reform that had to happen. And it passed uh, almost unanimously. Um, and I think that's very important that we change uh, benefits for future employees but not for existing employees or for existing retirees. Uh, we have to get a handle on our pension debt. Uh, we have had a long-standing practice of decades of not fully funding our pensions, not, not robbing from the pension funds, but not fully funding them. And Mr. Yunus. With that, uh, we uh, have an opportunity for uh, closing remarks. And uh, we'll start with the challenger for closing remarks, approximately 60 or 70 seconds. Well, um, H, I want to thank you again for, for having us. And I want to thank all the um, viewers uh, tuning into this. This is a very important race. Um, my campaign is filled with hard work. It's filled with grassroots. But most importantly, it's filled with common sense, something that I think our, our state has been lacking for quite some time. I'm running a very grassroots campaign, and I'm reaching out to thousands of individuals every day. I'm very optimistic, I'm very excited about this race, and I look forward to serving uh, everyone in the, the 91st District. Again, H, I appreciate you having us tonight. I look forward to meeting many more uh, constituents in the coming days as I've uh, made it to thousands of doorsteps, uh, and I would appreciate your vote on uh, November 2nd. And Mr. Smith. H, again, thank you uh, for this opportunity. Uh, I would just like to say that it's been my privilege to serve uh, as state representative of the 91st district for the past uh, many years, uh, representing all of uh, uh, central Illinois uh, from Fulton County to uh, Tazewell and parts of Peoria. Uh, I have uh, a record that I'm very proud to be running on. Uh, I think people who know me, uh, my constituents know, I'm not a slick politician, I'm not seeking higher office. Uh, I enjoy my job, I enjoy working for the people uh, of this area, uh, for our communities. I believe, uh, I'm an optimist, and I believe that uh, we can uh, take this crisis uh, that we're in and uh, have an opportunity to build a better uh, Illinois, a better central Illinois, a better 91st district. And so I uh, appreciate the support that I've received in the past, and I look forward to uh, the opportunity to continue to serve uh, the citizens of the 91st district. And with that, uh, our time is up just like that. Uh, I thank uh, both the challenger, Mike Yunus, uh, who is a council member uh, at uh, East Peoria, and uh, the incumbent, Mike Smith uh, from Canton. And I want to thank both of you for taking the time to run for public office. Thank I you. know it is a very difficult, time-consuming, um, steep learning curve, even when you're in office, a steep learning curve. And it seems like it happens all too often every two years. So thank you both for making thank the you. commitment to run thank for you. office, regardless of who wins. Thank you, H. Thanks. And this is just the first show of Political Month on that issue. Next week, 
Right here at the same table, we'll have Jahan Gordon, who is the incumbent Democrat from the 92nd District, and the challenge of the Republican Peoria City Council member, Jim Montalongo. That's next week on At Issue. Please join us then.